I like to focus on women and girls. The lives and stories of women are underrepresented in traditional history, and children are also very rarely mentioned in formal histories. Both categories of people also are harder to find archaeologically. However, at Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park, we've been very fortunate to find several clues to these unseen histories. And tonight, I will focus on several stories and try to bring them to life. Some of the examples that I'm going to talk about are featured in my new book, Alberta's Cornerstone Archaeological Adventures in Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. Other examples tonight refer to people that I just barely mentioned in the book, and tonight I'm going to give more detail about them. And some of the examples I've written about only in the Glenbow Ranch Park Foundation newsletter. Um, and there I only ever have room for one photograph. So tonight I can show a lot more photographs about some of those people. And I have a new discovery to share that seems to tie tonight's story together with a nice big pink bow. The archeological inspiration for the title is the fragment of the doll's face that you see in the picture. I'm gonna to start tonight's program by um, explaining the project that combines history and archeology span at Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. Then I'm going to give several case studies of girls and women from Glenbow. And then at the end, of course, there'll be time to answer any questions that you might have. So to begin, let's set the stage for this tonight's stories. Oh, that blinged. It doesn't want to advance my slide. There we go. So Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. It's located between Calgary and Cochrane. And the stories that I cover tonight are um, encompassed in the full range of the park. So the, we're going to meet, let's see if this is gonna work now when I try to advance my slide, yes. Nellie Dixon, the spook. Gertrude Vanderhoof, the poor little rich girl. Now I realize the dot is outside the boundaries of today's Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park, but during her lifetime, that area was part of the Glenbow community, so she qualifies. Then we've got Gertrude de Laverne, Alberta's first female aviator. Marion Moody, Alberta's first graduate nurse. Blythe Copeman, Glenbow's Rose. Evelyn Edwards, the young heroine. Margaret Malloy, a little lost soul and Floridora, a little girl who was an absolute doll. Now, how did all these women and girls come to be here? In 1883, the CPR reached Calgary. By the end of August, it was here at Glenbow. And you see on the map, Glenbow siding, you can see the water tank and the section house. And this, the name Glenbow comes from being in a glen by the bow, so it's quite a simple little name there. The CPR opened up the West to ranching and settlement and industry. And the railroad track ran beside a cliff of sandstone. So if you look up at the top left, you can see how close together this, the railroad track and the river are. And that's where that cliff is. Sandstone was very important. In 1886, the fire in Calgary destroyed its core when 17 wooden buildings burned down. So fire resistant building material was required when they rebuilt. Many sandstone quarries sprung up to use this local resource. In 1906, the Glenbow Quarry opened and the first company who owned it had in the company the man who had first seen Glenbow from the CPR construction train in 1883. Several different quarry companies owned the quarry through time. The major development began in 1909 and it's shown here in 1910 during its boom. Lots of men came to work here and some of the quarry men brought their families with them. In the foreground, we have the loading dock. Then there is a sloping track that leads up to the giant cutting mill on the middle level. And this cutting mill was said to be the largest sandstone processing plant in Canada at the time. The sandstone cliffs are above and behind in the background, and it's a beautifully detailed image. 
It also illustrates that bias sometimes causes us to overlook the obvious. In the center of the image, we have a woman. Now you might be surprised to find her here in the middle of an industrial site, but a few families lived at the middle level on the same level as the cutting mill, just off frame to the right in this picture, farther along the landform. Glenbow Quarry even had one female employee, Ida McCormick, who was the secretary or the bookkeeper or the accountant, depending on which historical document you happen to be looking at. And I discuss her in some detail in the book. I'm not going to discuss her tonight. The primary contract for Glenbow Quarry was for the government buildings. The major contract was for the Alberta legislature and almost all of the building was on the exterior was constructed of Glenbow sandstone, everything above the basement. Another building where the exterior was entirely Glenbow stone is government house. Now, of course, these are both located in Edmonton, but there are many other buildings across the province at all levels of government that used Glenbow stone. When we talk about quarries, history typically discusses the quarry men, but at Glenbow there was space for their wives and children. The local landowner beside the quarry, Chester de Laverne, decided to have a town site surveyed for the quarry workers and their families. He wanted to have them move in and purchase lots and populate his giant village that he was creating. However, it was not hugely successful as a money-making venture. Many of the families just pitched their tents and squatted on the land because quarry workers are transient. They have to follow the work. The largest number of people that were able to document by name living here at one time is 112. But I've found records that name more than 350 people who lived and worked here over time. The quarry was active from 1906 to 1913. Then people moved away for work. The quarrymen left right away, but some of the laborers, laborers managed to find local work and stayed longer. The last family left the village in 1927. Here's a view from the quarry to the town site in around 1926 at the end of the village's life. <clears throat> Then the village reverted back to ranch land. Chester de Laverne is shown here on the right and he sold his property, the giant ranch, to his friend, Eric Harvey, pictured on the left. Eric was also a lawyer, Chester's lawyer, and he eventually became a rich oil man. He enlarged the, the ranch over the decades and eventually the Harvey family sold the land to the province for a reduced value in exchange for a charitable donation tax receipt for the balance of the value. And that became Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. It opened in 2011. As you can see, it's a beautiful place and it's very popular. I first came to Glenbow in 2009 as an archeological volunteer mapping building depressions in the village. From there on, I began researching the history of Glenbow and I looked at the typical archival documents and air photos and that sort of thing. But then I thought that we could find out more information if we could find descendants of the people who used to live there. And I'm so thankful for their generous contributions. So many of them shared stories and photographs and some even contributed financially to the Archaeological Society's project. I'm going to be talking about archaeology, <clears throat> and I mentioned that Glenbow was well preserved by ranch land since its abandonment, and it's now in a provincial park. But as a reminder, all historical resources in Alberta are protected by law because they belong to all Albertans. All artifacts that are dug up by archaeologists are sent to the Royal Alberta Museum. It's not treasure hunting and we don't get to keep what we find you have to have a permit in order to excavate. I was part of the excavations at Glenbow in 2013, 2015, and in 2017, I got my own excavation permit, and that's the subject of my book, 
I use the project as a framework for exploring the history of various areas of the park. A volunteer crew excavated a small area in search of the single men's bunkhouse. And that's what you see happening here. I taught archeological techniques and I met people from all walks of life. And I'm very thankful for their contribution to the project. Excavations over the years revealed several artifacts that represent women and girls. Ceramics are a typical type of artifact that we find, and this one has a very feminine floral pattern, but all it indicates is a domestic site. It doesn't mean that there was a woman present. This is the head of a safety pin. Now it's useful for diapers for sure, but it also has many other uses, so it doesn't really indicate the presence of a baby. Here's a piece of bent wire. Now we found a lot of old rusty wire, but this one is actually very exciting because it's a hairpin and hairpins were used by women. So we know that there was a woman present. And these are fragments of porcelain bisque doll. And at that era, that meant little girls. So let's visit our first little girl from Glenville. This leads us to Nellie Dixon. In 2013, I decided to trace the family of the quarry foreman who lived in the area where the first doll fragments were found. And I located his granddaughter, Dorothy, and she shared family photographs. Here we have Ellen or Nellie standing beside her littlest sister, Sarah May. Then we have Bella and their mom, Annabella, and their dad, Robert. So I asked Dorothy about Nellie's toys. What did the little girls play with when they lived at Glenbow? Dorothy told me her mom received a special doll while they were living there, an unbreakable porcelain doll. Now, I of course had no knowledge about dolls of this era and I said, but that doesn't make any sense. Porcelain, how can it be unbreakable? It's so fragile. And she explained that she was a doll collector herself and that an unbreakable porcelain doll had a piece of cork on the back of the doll's head so that when the little girl laid her doll down, the cork would absorb the impact and prevent the face from cracking. So I asked, did she still have the doll? And she said, no, but she still had the shoes. And that seemed a bit odd. So I asked why, and she said that it was because when the little neighbor boy found out that Nellie had received an unbreakable porcelain doll, he said, oh, I can break that, and he smashed it with a hammer. All they were able to salvage were the shoes. So the fragments that were found nearby could be from Nellie's doll. Now I had recognized Nellie when I saw her in this photograph because I had seen her in another photograph from an archive. And here she is. And this photograph tells us the importance of old photos. Beside her, we find Bella, her middle sister. And from the costumes that the children are wearing, I'm sure you can see that it's Halloween. Now, I also recognized another little girl in this photograph and her presence dated the photograph to 1911. And that's because I know when she was at Glenbow. So I showed this photograph to Dorothy and she was ecstatic. She'd never seen the photograph before. And the thing that thrilled her the most about it was that it was a Halloween photograph because that was Nellie's birthday. On October 31st, 1911, Nellie had her 12th birthday. And because she was born on Halloween, her nickname for herself was the Spook. Now another spooky detail in this photograph is the shadow in the foreground on the grass. That's the person taking the photograph and the silhouette shows us that it's a woman and Nellie is looking right at her. The next little girl I want to talk about is Gertrude Vanderhoof. Now I decided to investigate the Vanderhoof family because it was an unusual family group, a single mom with her only daughter. This is Mrs. Gertrude Vanderhoof and her daughter also named Gertrude Vanderhoof. I had a challenge tracking down these descendants, but I discovered a story of a poor little rich girl and a wealth of family photographs of Glenbow. Gertrude Sr. married Frank Vanderhoof. 
They were both independently wealthy New Yorkers and together they had baby Gertrude. But shortly thereafter, Gertrude took the baby and left Frank and they were estranged. Gertrude Sr. visited her old friend, Catherine Stevenson at Glenbow. This is the Stevenson house. And it was at the aptly named Quarry Ranch because the stones for this house came from their own private quarry located nearby. This photograph shows the house when it was newly built and decorated. And today it stands in ruins outside the park, but you can see it from the trails. At the start of World War I, the Stevensons returned to England and the Vanderhoofs moved in. The Vanderhoofs spent their summers at Glenbow and winters in New York, just as the other New Yorkers in the neighborhood did. And here we see a summer event, young Gertrude Vanderhoof's ninth or 10th birthday picnic at Glenbow on August 31st. Now beside her is another little girl who's about the same age and has the same bow in her hair. And we're gonna meet her in a minute. I think that's Gertrude de Laverne. In the center of this photograph, it's fuzzy, but it's Gertrude Vanderhoof and the de Laverne children, I think, on either side of her. In the spring of 1919, 12-year-old Gertrude and her mother left Glenbow for good. They were off to Japan, China, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. And I think that might be where this photograph was taken, somewhere in this tropical area because of the plants in the background. Young Gertrude grew up and she finally got to spend a bit of time with her dad on her own. Then she made a splash in English high society. In 1928, she married the son of a former Lord Mayor of London. And this is his crest, his family crest. This son became an army officer and eventually a brigadier general. Together they had a daughter, but unfortunately they had an unhappy marriage and young Gertrude divorced her army man. She later remarried in Nevada. Now both of these Gertrude Vanderhoofs had unhappy marriages and they used up the family fortune, but the wealth of photographs from Glenbow were passed down. And these photographs are the only known record of several buildings at Glenbow, including the elevator, the brick plant, and the interior of the Stevenson's house. And some of those photographs are in my book. A friend of Gertrude Vanderhoof was Gertrude de Laverne, and she belonged to Alberta's Jet Set. She was also born in New York. In 1909, at the age of three, her when she was three, Gertrude, her dad, Chester de Laverne, bought the Glenbow Horse Ranch. And Gertrude spent most of the next decade in Glenbow. And as you recall, Chester de Laverne was the one who laid out the town site. She was raised on Glenbow's Millionaire Hill. And this was populated by the family and friends of the de Laverne's, and they each had their own mansions. And they would get together and play polo and go horse racing and throw each other fancy parties. When Gertrude was 13, Chester's business interests changed and the family moved into Calgary. Gertrude excelled at school and the newspaper social pages were filled with accounts of her attending dances and tea parties and she was a member of drama societies and various clubs. That's her with her little brother. <clears throat> now, Gertrude loved adventure. New Year's Day 1927 found her and her mother in Fez, Morocco. From there, they motored through Northern Africa to Algiers, eventually returning through France to New York and eventually Calgary. The intrepid Gertrude found a new passion later that year. When the Calgary Aero Club formed, she became an active member and she spent all her time studying flight she read airplane magazines and manuals, and even the fiction she read had to do with flying. She even took apart a secondhand automobile engine to see how it worked. And she had the full support of her dad. On the 7th of November, 1928, hundreds of people gathered at Calgary's aerodrome to witness Gertrude's initial solo flight. 
Of the candidates at the time, Gertrude achieved the highest grade on the flight exam for a private pilot's license, surpassing the other eight pilots, all men. She was the first full-fledged private pilot in the club, and she got her license on the 8th of December, 1928. At the age of 22, she was the first female pilot in Alberta and the third in all of Canada. Fearless Gertrude performed stunts at air shows, bursting special balloons with her propeller. She even changed clothes in mid-flight. She was also enterprising. She was the first editor and the publication manager of the club's magazine, and she was the aviation columnist for the Calgary Herald. She also learned how to fly gliders, and she became the secretary treasurer of the local glider club. However, her dad's businesses suffered in the crash in the 1930s, and Gertrude's dream of earning a commercial pilot's license went up in smoke. In 1932, she married Reginald Tanner, and together they had two children and five grandchildren. Gertrude lived to be 91 years old, and she fondly recounted stories of her youth on the grasslands of Glenbow Ranch and in the skies above Calgary. Marion Moody is the next woman we're going to talk about. Like many of us, she chose her profession when she was young. At the age of 12, she helped a convalescing friend and decided to become a nurse. In 1891, she arrived at Glenbow at the age of 24 with her adult siblings, her parents, and her young cousins at the request of a widowed cousin named Leslie Hill, who was a rancher who had moved to Calgary. The Moody's spent three years on the ranch. Her brother was a ranch hand, and that's him in the center of the picture, and the little girls are her three little cousins. Marion helped to nurse the family when they were sick, and it's a good thing because they were sick. Her brother contracted typhoid and eventually had to be taken into Calgary to the hospital, and her three little cousins caught scarlet fever. She also nursed her mother, who was really ill, and in 1894, they moved to Calgary, and her mother died there. In March of 1895, Marion helped the nurses at Calgary's nine-bed cottage hospital, and in April, she was accepted on probation as a volunteer, and she worked the night shift. Three weeks later, Calgary's new city hospital opened, and you can see it in the center of this picture. After two months, she qualified officially as a student nurse, and she was soon supervising another probationer and another student. Her work was exhausting and hazardous. Disease transmission was poorly understood. Many vaccines had not yet been invented. And after a nine week period of grueling night duty, she herself succumbed to typhoid. She was bedridden for seven weeks, but she persevered with her education. In 1898, she became Alberta's first graduate nurse. She spent the next few years traveling to patients, including the next Glenbow female that we'll meet in a moment. People had high expectations of her. She had to work in primitive conditions and she received insufficient and sometimes non-existent pay. So eventually she moved and became the nurse at the hospital at Frank. There she was responsible for eight hospital patients she treated the outpatients. She administered anesthetic during surgeries. She filled in for the doctor when he was away. She cooked the patient's meals. She milked the cow and she scrubbed the floor. Pretty arduous work. A couple of years later, she returned to Calgary and again became a private nurse in patients' homes. But even that was hard work and sometimes she had to walk eight miles a day. This took a toll on her and she had to take a break from nursing for a few years. When World War I came along, she was packing supplies for the Red Cross and she was the assistant matron of the Ogden Veterans Hospital. And then in 1917, at the age of 50, 
she enlisted in the Canadian Army Medical Corps and became the nursing sister in charge of the hospital. After the war, she nursed in Manitoba and Montreal. But Marion's story doesn't end there. She did a lot more than just nurse. She was also an accomplished painter. Here she is painting and a friend is sitting beside her. And this is one of the pictures that she painted. This is Glenbow and she painted it in 1892. And you can see in the center a train with steam going by. But beyond that, she was also a published poet. 10 of her poems were collected in a book called Songs of the West in 1904. And this is one of her poems, A Song of the West. Oh, wind that comes out of the West, the land of the sunset skies, where far o'er yon mountain's crest, those glorious colors rise. You bring me the fragrance of pine, the coolness of mountain snow, the music of falling streams by the hill where the lilies grow. O oh, wind that comes out of the west, you sigh on your way to the plain. The mountain's land is best. Will you not come back again? Glow skies with your golden light. Blow softly, dear wind from the hill. For my heart has a longing tonight that only the west can fill. And one of her poems was even set to music. But again, she did even more. She was also a botanist. She collected specimens and sent them off to various herbariums between the years of 1913 and 1918. And some of her specimens are held in McGill University. Some are held at the RAM, or at the Provincial Archives, I should say. And um, the Department of Botany Collections in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History has 637 of her specimens. The Gray Herbarium in Harvard has 200 specimens that Marion submitted. The Chicago Field Museum has 68 specimens and the New York Botanical Garden Steer Herbarium has 142 specimens. She was an amazing person. Now I mentioned that after graduation as a nurse, she traveled to patients. And we know that she returned to Glenbow at least once because she was present at the birth of the next female that I'm going to discuss, Constance Blythe Copeman. You've heard of Alberta's wild rose, but I think of Blythe as Glenbow's rose. In 1900, William and Edith Copeman left England and decided to have the adventure of Alberta homesteading. They purchased Waverly Ranch, which is now in Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. Waverly grew, William acquired more land, he also got 500 cattle, work and range horses, chickens and pigs, and the family grew. Their first child, Jack, was born in 1900. In March of 1902, Blythe's adventurous life began. William was fetching the doctor from Calgary, but the men lost the trail home in the blizzard and they arrived too late. However, Blythe was delivered safely thanks to nurse Marion Moody. Blythe spent the first four years of her life at Waverly and maybe because of this lifestyle she became very athletic and perhaps the wildflowers of Glenbow inspired her love of gardening. But life for the Copemans was not always a bed of roses. One of the children fell down the well and had to be rescued and then in 1906 another baby boy joined the family but little Humphrey lived just one week and his is the only known burial in the park. Shortly after his death, the Copemans sold Waverly and moved to British Columbia heartbroken. William went into real estate and bought a large lot in Vancouver. He was also a painter and self-taught and he was also a poet. And here is one of his paintings. This is Stanley Park on e an English Bay. But the Copemans had adventurous spirits and they had several travel adventures. Here they are in about 1912. They shipped their car to San Francisco and drove through Southern California in their Studebaker. In 1914, they decided to visit England and they bought tickets on the steamship. But then at the last minute, they altered their plans to detour to New York and sail from there. They gave up their tickets for the Empress of Ireland 
and narrowly avoided the largest peacetime maritime disaster in Canada. 1,012 lives were lost when the Empress collided with another ship and she sank in only 14 minutes. But lucky Blythe grew up and she met a soldier who was on leave visiting his family in Victoria, BC. George Perks fought bravely in World War I. He was wounded five times and was awarded the Victoria Cross, the Commonwealth's highest honor for valor. Within nine days of meeting, they became engaged. And this is the engagement portrait painted by her father, William. And you can see Blythe wearing her engagement dress, which she knit herself. And it looks like she's got a rose at that front of her dress there. George returned to Manitoba where he was stationed, but he wrote to Blythe every day for a year until they were married in 1925. The Perks eventually had two children and they had a loving family. Here's a photograph of the Copemans and the Perks. So on the left, we have William Copeman. Then there's the nurse who took care of the children. We've got Priscilla known as Pep and then little John and then Edith Copeman and George and Bly the Perks. And again, Pep's fate was not so rosy. She contracted an infection in infancy and died at the age of seven. George, eventually, he rose in military rank and he became stationed in England in 1936 to 1938. Blytha was formally presented at court in 1937. She was sponsored by Mrs. Vincent Massey and she curtsied to the newly crowned King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, who you may remember as the Queen Mother. And this is another of William's paintings showing the outfit that Blythe wore to her court presentation. The Perks returned to live in Calgary from 1938 to 1940. And in 1939, the King and Queen visited Calgary and Blythe was asked by the uninitiated and anxious military elite to show them the proper curtsy protocol. Incidentally, the Eric Harvey family were close friends of the Perks. Blythe's son, John, went to school with Eric Harvey's son, Neil. In World War II, George became a major general and Blythe had to entertain all levels of society. She was a hostess to the military elite and also to the student cadets. She could pitch in with the cooking if she needed to. She knitted socks and she served in the military canteens all for the war effort. After the war, George became, they returned to Canada, George became a member of parliament and the minister of national defense from 1957 to 1960. He was appointed Lieutenant Governor of BC in 1960, where he was until 1968. So Blythe became the Chatelaine of Government House in Victoria, surrounded by beautiful gardens, and she welcomed many visitors to Government House, including the Queen Mother, the Queen that she had been presented to. About this time, the Perkses visited Calgary for the Stampede. In 1968, Constance Blythe Perks was granted an honorary doctorate of law from the University of Victoria for using her abilities and powers of leadership to serve a wide variety of causes concerned with helping the sick and those in need. In that same year, 1968, a hybrid tea rose was named after her. And here she is with it, the Madame Blythe Perks Rose. It has medium sized double flowers that are light apricot flushed with yellow and pink. When they retired, they moved to their Saanich home where they became avid gardeners or continued to be avid gardeners. Blythe was known as a good listener, someone who is egoless and ceaselessly positive with wit and good humor, a lovely Glenbow Rose. Most examples of the Glenbow females that I'm discussing tonight were noteworthy because of what they did or what they accomplished as adults. But another little girl born at Glenbow did something very important while she was still a child. She became a heroine. 
In 1910, Jesse Dewar and Cecil Edwards married and moved to Glenbow. This is the Glenbow Supply Company store in its early years, and this is where they lived because Cecil was the storekeeper and the postmaster. Here's a modern photograph, and it shows the addition that was placed on the south side of the building, which is the left in this photograph. And that building addition was present during the Edwards occupation of the store. In April 1912, Evelyn was born at Glenbow. And this is the family on the steps of the store. The Edwards were important to the community because of Cecil's role as storekeeper and postman. And here they are, here's Evelyn with her dad at Buck Spring Ranch, which is located just outside today's park gates. Evelyn's little brother Harris was born at Glenbow as well in 1915. And here they are at the James Place, which you pass as you drive into the park. It's the old ranch to your left as you drive in. In 1918, the family said goodbye to Glenbow and they moved to a farm at Delia, Alberta, where the family grew. And it's here where Evelyn became a hero. On the 1st of December, 1923, when Evelyn was 11 years old, her parents drove into town, the five miles, and they left her in charge of her three younger brothers. Harris by now was eight, and they had Alan, who was three years old, and Basil was 11 months old. While Evelyn was caring for Basil, one of the other young boys began playing with a lantern and matches, and he inadvertently set fire to the hen house. The local newspaper reported what happened next. Evelyn inspected the extent of the fire, decided it was beyond anything she could manage and got busy with the telephone. Neighbors rushed to the rescue. Losses included the hen house, 10 chickens, a granary and a wagon. But Evelyn's pluck and presence of mind had saved the house, the barn and the lives of her brothers and the family was able to have a happy new year. Now, her story ended quite happily, but we don't have such a happy ending for another little Glenbow girl, and that is Margaret Malloy, the little lost soul. There are no known photographs of her, just a ghost of information about her. Here's the excerpt from the 1911 census of Glenbow, where she is shown at the age of four. She appears with her parents and her eight-month-old brother, and they are living in the bunkhouse with 21 men at Glenbow Quarry. Her father was the quarry foreman and her parents ran the bunkhouse or also known as the boarding house at that time. Now I became interested in Margaret because of an unusual artifact that was found during my 2017 excavation at the bunkhouse site and it's shown here circled in red. It's a broken piece of porcelain it doesn't look like much. The volunteer who found it thought it was a chunk of a broken teacup. But when we turned it over and washed it off, voila, it brings us back to the beginning of tonight's story. It's a piece of a doll's face. Could this be the same doll as the other fragments found nearby in earlier excavations? Or is it a different doll? Was it Nellie Dixon's doll or Margaret Malloy's doll? All we have is a few fragments and we don't know if they tie together. So I investigated Margaret's life to see if I could find a Malloy descendant who might know something about the doll. Maybe I would be as lucky as I had been with the Dixon family. But what I discovered was that Margaret never grew up to have children of her own. In 1912, she caught scarlet fever. She was sick for six days and she died in Calgary's isolation hospital before her fifth birthday. She was buried in St. Mary's Cemetery in Calgary, and she was followed to the grave two weeks later by her baby brother, James. Sadly, the pre precise location of the burials has been lost over time. Eventually, I located a descendant of a sibling who had been born later, but no Glenbow stories had survived the tragedies. 
Now that's kind of a sad way to come to the end of a presentation. And thankfully I'm able to end it on a happier note because of a recent discovery I actually just made last week when I found this on an auction site on the internet. And when you zoom in and you compare it to the doll's fragment that we have from the archeological site, they match. This is Flora Dora. She's a bisque doll with original clothing. She's 14 and a half inches tall. She was made in Germany by the Armand Marseille company and she's the Floradora model. And that refers to the bisque head. Now the Floradora head could have two forms. It could have a base that had a socket or it could have extended onto porcelain shoulders. If you had the socket head, then it would be put onto a composition body, which is the case in this photograph. If you look at her hands, you can see that they have a different look than her face. Composition is when the body is composed of sawdust and glue and other materials like cornstarch and resin and wood flour. And composition dolls were marketed as unbreakable. Or if you had the head and shoulders version of Floradora, then that would be attached to a body made out of kid leather and stuffed with cork and then there would be bisque arms attached. And so here you can see that with the kid body and the little arms attached. And this kid version was also marketed as unbreakable. So Nellie's unbreakable porcelain doll turns out not to be a misnomer since there was quite a variety of doll forms marketed as being unbreakable. Glenbow's little Floradora face could have been attached to either body form because we don't have the base to know for sure. The face alone doesn't tell us if it's the same doll as the other fragments and it doesn't clarify the owner of the doll. But if the head and shoulders were the version of Floradora, then the other fragments that we found could be her arm. So to conclude, you never know where historical research will lead you when you start digging up the past. You could find female trailblazers like those from Glenbow. You might even find out that working class children like those who called Glenbow home played important roles in allowing us to piece history back together. I hope that I've brought to life the unseen history of Glenbow's girls and women. The females that I've discussed today are just a sample. Other Glenbow females include a woman who mysteriously fell off a passing express train, a girl who became a chemist working for the US government in World War II, a mother of 10 children, a cook who worked for elite Calgarians, an English governess, and a girl who became a member of an international spy agency. You can find out more about Glenbow and the fascinating people who lived there in my book, or you can read the blog on my website, which is listed there. You can visit the Park Interpretive Center and there you will find the Glenbow family photo album, which I've put together with some other pictures and families. Thank you for joining me tonight. Amazing, Sherry. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information. It was such a wonderful presentation. I feel like I learned so much for, about the Glenbow Ranch um, women and girls that you shared. And it's just amazing. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, at this point in time, we'd like to open um, the chat up to anyone who would like to ask any questions. Um, there's already a few comments coming in saying, thank you, Sherry. That was very interesting. Um, what a thoughtful, well-woven set of stories. Thank you so much. Just lots of thank yous coming in. Excellent research, great presentation. Thank you. Um, Shelly is saying, thank you, Sherry. I've been looking forward to this presentation for weeks and it was amazing. And I agree, it was amazing. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Colleen says, outstanding. This, that was really interesting. So glad you're researching women and children. Um, so 
there, I'm going to ask you a question. What first sparked your interest um, in researching the Glenville Ranch area and the women and um, girls from that area? Hmm. Well, it was such a beautiful place to be. So that was one thing that kind of got me hooked right away. And then it was the chase. Um, I started finding different kinds of documents. And um, when I exhausted the regular kind, um, I thought, well, surely there might be more out there and started picking um, people to research. And then as I get going with it, it's sort of addictive. I shouldn't say sort of, it is. I'm obsessed. I, I admit it. I'm obsessed. And it's it's a puzzle to figure out um, each family that I do to try to trace them forward in time and find find descendants. And I believe there's even a few who are who are with us tonight. So thank you for coming. Amazing. Yes, thank you for those um, descendants whose Jerry has shared your family stories. That's amazing. Um, there's a question here in the chat. Are there future excavations planned at the ranch? Um, not as far as I know. Um, you need such special circumstances to be able to excavate. You have to have special permits and you have to have a special reason to excavate. Um, so in our case, it was for research. Um, another reason would be for conservation. And if there was a threat to the park, then um, research would be done to assess uh, what is being threatened. So most of the archaeology in the province is done by consulting companies in advance of some kind of development. Okay, that's very interesting. And can um, volunteers come and excavate after these um, companies start surveying the area or? Um, it depends on what the company's plan is. If they are relying on unpaid volunteers instead of paid staff. So I, it, it's, in, it's dependent on whatever they do. There are all kinds of, um, you know, uh, travel vacations to England to go on excavations and things like that. I've always thought that would be neat to go someplace where you stick your trowel in the ground and you find a, a Roman mosaic or something like that. Yeah, that is pretty cool. And actually someone asked in the chat, um, Jerry, have you excavated any other parks in Calgary or Alberta? Alberta? Yes, in Alberta. I, I only studied and, and worked in Alberta. Um, my thought was that way I, I was safe from disease and violence, generally speaking. Um, so I didn't go on exotic digs. Um, I've worked at Heads Nashed Inn and the Tuscany um, development and Fort Calgary. Um, that was an amazing experience to work at, at Fort Calgary before the latest um, buildings and development went up there. Do you have any interest in also researching and going through the histories of women from Fort Calgary as well? The way you have with the Glenbow Ranch? <laughs> Uh, I haven't investigated that. Um, I, I don't know much about that. I, I mean, I was there when we did do some um, excavations and saw the post holes of the original um, fort, and that was super cool. Um, and I did at that time, we in it was the University of Calgary excavation there, and they did dig up a little tiny toy gun, which suggested that there had been a child present at some point, but uh, I hadn't. I haven't done any research on it specifically. Okay. Um, there's a comment here in the chat as well. They said, Wendy said, we, we do well to remember the many pioneer children who died young of many causes and who have unmarked or even unknown graves, not just indigenous kids. Modern media stories forget this important context. So interesting point, yes. In the past, there was a very high mortality rate for, for young children and also for mothers giving birth. Um, today, there are so many, you know, treatments and things for not only, you know, giving birth itself, but afterwards, you know, a lot of women died of complications. And there are cases of that that happened at Glenbow and that I talked about in the book. Perfect. And then um, Sam in the chat said, um, looking forward to going to the Glenville Ranch and seeing where my Charik, 
if you I think I'm pronouncing that maybe Cherik. incorrectly. Cherik, yeah, Cherik family once lived. Shout out to all other descendants. So, yay! <laughs> That's great. I'm so glad you came tonight. And yeah, contact me by email. Yeah, the Cheriks are a story that are in the book too, and they're pretty cool, exciting family too. They, they had little boys when they were at the park, and that's why I didn't talk about them specifically today. <laughs> <laughs> but they were pretty amazing, too. Yeah, if you want to learn more, please borrow Sherry's book or purchase Sherry's book. We have copies at the library, so. <laughs> um, Harry's asking, are there plans to have some of this information about women at the Glenbow added to their visitor center or more storyboards at the park? Oh, that's a good question. I'll have to ask the executive director about that. Um, they are revamping a lot of their signage in the park right now because it, after 11 years, it's getting a little bit sun faded. So I'm not sure what kind of changes they're planning on making. I don't know if they're going to incorporate some more of that or not. Hopefully they do. That'd be cool. Hopefully they do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so Colleen is asking, where can we get your book? Ah, well, if you purchase it through the Visitor's Centre at Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park, then some of the profits go to them. I should say the profits section of the, of the book cost goes to them. Um, you can also find it at Chapters Indigo uh, in stores. Uh, and I saw it at Heritage Park when I visited last week. Um, so you can purchase it there. You can also get it online at Amazon or Indigo. And uh, Owl's Nest had some, I know that. I don't know if they still do. Support the small stores if you can. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, so there seems to be a pause in the questions in the chat, but I'm going to ask you one as well. Um, so you kind of, you talked about Marion Moody and how um, she had, she was an artist, a painter. Can we find any of her work at the Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park? It's most specifically, it's specifically the one that's titled Glenbow. Um, that one is actually held at the Glenbow Western Research Center at the University of Calgary. Oh, cool. And so I had to get special permission. It's kind of complicated. It's physically at the university in that collection, but it belongs to the Glenbow Museum uh, downtown. So they've retained a lot of the artworks. And um, so I had to get permission from the museum to use it to have the university scan it. Um, so there is that. And the university, the Glenbow Western Research Center also has some of her pressed flowers, but they're not as great as the ones that are at the other archives because the herbariums um, have so many things that are the same um, format that they can preserve them so much better. Um, and probably they were the better quality ones to begin with. There are There is another lovely painting that um, Marion did that's held at the university. And it's a picture of roses with a butterfly. And she's even done it trompe l'oeil trying to show the shadow of the flowers. So that's another lovely one. Thank you. Um, so there's a question in the chat here. Why are none of the buildings serving at Glenbow? Why does, why does just the store survive? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, when people moved away uh, from the village specifically, the buildings were either carted off whole, you know, on a wagon, or they were with wheels placed on them, or they, they were um, slid across the river on ice on sleds down to Bonesse, or they were taken apart and salvaged for lumber, which was the case for the bunkhouse itself, or they were you know, falling into disrepair and they were burned down so that they wouldn't be a hazard to the cattle. The store remains because it's a larger building. It's like two buildings stuck together. And during the ranching era in the 1950s, they actually tried to store grain inside of it. So they were trying to use it and that's why it stayed, but it turned out the weight of the grain collapsed the floors. So that didn't really last very well. So 
yeah, that's why there are no buildings there because they wanted it to be ranched. Um, Pat says in the chat, thanks, Sherry. Enjoyed the presentation and your work in general and still reading your book. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Pat is also a member of the Historical um, Society of Alberta, and he's the Peace River um, president of the um, group there. So, Thanks for joining us, Pat. <laughs> um, do the pathways at Glenbow have some, have some historic significance? Yes, they do. Um, all of the paved pathways are uh, uh, placed on top of the original roads that the um, settlers moved across. So um, as you're going from the middle of the park to the east, you'll be on the main trail. And at the time it was called De Laverne Avenue because he had grand designs. And that was placed on top of, you know, indigenous um, pathways as well, you know, routes that people would take. It's very common for them to be then used by the settler groups. So I'm not sure what evidence we have for indigenous use of them in this specific area, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. And the reason that the park pathways are on top of the historic pathways is that it helps to minimize impact on the other areas of the park. And when you're in the park, please stay on the paths. <laughs> yeah, very important to preserve the park. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and there are also gravel pathways as well. So it's not all paved. There's a variety. Um, can people volunteer to work with you on digs? Not with me personally, because I don't have any permits right now to dig anywhere. Um, but yes, you can find opportunities for volunteering. Um, and the park itself, it would be thrilled to have you come and volunteer. There are all different kinds of um, activities you can do at the park. You can take care of bluebird boxes, doing surveys. You can deal with um, plants. You can guide tours. You can uh, drive golf carts. You can, to, when you're guiding the tours, not for fun, there's no golfing there anymore. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. They need people in the visitor center to keep it open on the weekends. Um, so they'd be thrilled to have people come out and volunteer. Um, um, how far back in your research um, have you found evidence of women and um, girls living in Glenbow Ranch. Like, what's the earliest that you, earliest date, date that you found evidence for? Okay. Um, historically, I can answer that. Um, archaeologically, I can't. That would be mm -hmm. what I've covered already. Um, there were, you know, early ranchers there in 1891. Um, so 1890-ish, we've got, you know, men with their wives. Um, so that's probably the earliest mm -hmm. that specifically relates to women, but there were earlier ranches there. It's just, I don't have evidence of women being there. Okay. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Sherry? Um, why are you not able to excavate more of the park? Well, as archaeologists, you never want to excavate everything of any particular site, because as we dig, we destroy it. And that's why we take such meticulous notes and photographs and things. So you'd never want to dig it all up. But the park is actually huge, so it's pretty much impossible to dig the whole park up. And even the village itself, I mean, it's quite big, so you would never um, be able to get it all. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> Why, sorry. Why are you not able to excavate more of the park? Okay. Um, because, okay, so the answer to that would be because um, to get a permit, you have to have a research question and you have to have um, a reason why they should say yes to your research question. So for me, it was because I was specifically looking for something that would 
illuminate the history. The bunkhouse was the main thing I was looking for. And um, you'd also have to have some kind of funding to be able to do it. And um, yeah, it doesn't happen as much as you think. Okay. <laughs> um, how did you track down the descendants of these women and girls that lived in the Glenville Ranch area? Well, I used genealogical techniques. I'm also a member of the Alberta Family History Society, and I do my own family history. So in, in those cases with genealogy, you tend to work backwards in time. But instead, I was working from 1910 or 1911 forwards in time. So um, I would use whatever resources I could find, the standard, you know, censuses and that sort of thing. And then a lot of sleuthing on the internet. Um, I have one friend who told me I was, uh, I forget what the word is, where you sort of sneakily um, <laughs> search for people. <laughs> I wasn't sneaky about it, but I was determined. So, and it's shocking how much information, how much personal information modern people leave lying around on the internet. I cannot tell you how careful you really should be because not everybody is going to be after you for a nice reason like me. <laughs> Protect your privacy. 